on ex speaker writes about himself. I have no academic background worth mentioning. I am not a member of any prestigious association. My work hasn't been featured in any design book. I don't teach at any renowned university. I never won any awards. My talent for being able to identify most typefaces on site is utterly useless in daily life. Um, said by you. We invited him anyway. Um, I think, in fact, he's one of the leading design writers in the world. Uh, he's, he's putting up uh, yeah, on, on many very important uh, sites, his comments, his texts, and uh, we're glad that you're here, Eve. Uh, it's your stage. Uh. something about what will this movie be about. 
it may seem silly, but Vignette says, if I write dog in Helvetica, it's still dog, but I don't think that's true. You can, by using a certain typeface, infuse your message with extra meaning and uh, convey more information than just words that uh, the words that the letters spell. Yeah, that's the whole screen. Okay. But right now we're going to look at functional criteria. And more specifically, what's under the hood? Because you may look at a typeface like a car and say, all right, I like this model. But you, of course, you have to know what can it do? What are the possibilities of your typeface that you want to use? The problem is that um, we are fooled by our computers. Because the computers, originally, the type, um, the keyboard, was um, copied from the early type parameters. So what you see is a very limited amount of characters. There's a lot more in your typefaces than you just see at first sight. So if you try to judge your typeface by just looking at its appearance, then you're only looking at this, you know, the shifts, and then maybe, yeah, also now we know about options, so on, this very limited representation of, of your typeface. It's as if you were looking at your typeface through a keyhole, you just see a very small part. Where the typeface I just showed, this is actually what one can get. So there's a lot more possibilities, and all these characters, all these signs, can be used properly in your design, in your typography. So this, of course, um, the big change came in the early 2000s with the advent of OpenType because the format came with a number of enhancements uh, in relation to a PostScript, where it has one of practical reasons. You have the single cross-platform font files that you can use on all the computer systems, but also on the web. But what's very important as well is the Unicode character encoding that is um, supporting so many writing scripts and also now we have all these glyphs that are these letters, these characters that are available also in your web design. And also the advanced typographic features that Tim was uh, showcasing, stuff like also numeral small caps and so on. So um, this is a big advancement. So now this means that we come from a situation on the web where there was a very limited scope for typography and now in a couple of years, we made huge steps, and now we have much more possibilities. So we can, at last, bring these stuff, these things that we used in print typography, finally to the web and have a much better uh, typographic control. And this, for example, this is an overview of uh, all the um, uh, open type features that font fonts uh, uh, offer, and it's yeah, it's just more than enough that these things. Uh, many of these typefaces even become intelligent. They, as you type, they sense what you want to do, and if you say, oh, I don't want certain kind of alternates or whatever uh, ligature, contextual, it will replace on the spot, like we saw with the Definitive, the FI, but there's so much more in there that can be used. Of course, you must not be fooled by the word open type, because it's just the format you could see it as a toolbox. So it's not because you use a certain typeface of a certain format that you immediately have all these possibilities as well. Because the format can be seen as a toolbox. It all depends what's in there. If a type designer just makes some basic shapes, he goes alphabet, uppercase, lowercase, and punctuation, some, uh, some uh, yeah, numbers, then you won't be able to do all these advanced features. They have to be drawn, all these characters, all the features have to be coded. So it's like having a toolbox and you have a hammer and a, and a saw and pliers, but you don't have a screwdriver. You won't do much. Oh, no, sorry, over there. So we, I talked about print, print typography. Uh, one aspect that's very different. Uh, from typography on the web is the fact that in print typography the appearance is static. You do something, you print it, and it's there. So what your audience will see is exactly what you show them. So basically all you need to know is 
what the typography has to look like. You just go for appearance. You may have some understanding why stuff has to look a certain way, but it's sufficient that your end result looks correct and your audience will see it correctly. Of course, this drastically changes with web typography because the web is a fluid dynamic medium. What happens? There is no WYSIWYG. You may intend the audience to see something, but at your end, there's somebody sitting at his computer looking at the browser, and like Tim also showed, can resize the browser. If somebody leaves something that you meant to be very wide becomes very narrow. You can also enlarge it by because uh, for eyesight, uh, in this view, there's a lot of feedback. Can I? Is it better? Yeah. Okay, sorry about this. Um, so it's very important when doing web typography that you do not focus on what you want it to look like. You have to implement everything that you want the typeface to do in any conditions. So it's not the end result that's important, but your own intention. And there are a couple of examples in there that will explain better what I mean. Um, one of the things that you may want to do is, at some point, you may want to uh, emphasize something in your text. Of course, the first thing, referring to the toolbox thing, you have to know if your typeface includes all the necessary styles that you want to show. Because you could fake italics if you use, for example, Lucida Grande, because it doesn't have any italics. And so for bold, so what's going to do is the browser is going to like push it sideways or, or uh, print it a, couple of, a number of times on top of each other. So you know you want italic type, you want bold type, but it's not even there. So what happens, you focus on appearance and you're not getting the result you want. So you would better use a typeface that has, of course, the proper italics and proper bolds, and then only then you will have um, the correct appearance. Coming to the bold and italic tags, this should be abolished. You should never use these. Because what you, you again, you're focusing on appearance, but what you want to do is focus on what you want to put, do with your typography. So instead of the bold, you always use the strong and so the type most emphasis. Why? Because by simply changing your CSS file, you can adapt to a new design. You don't have to do any new markup or whatever, because there you use the actual intention of your, what you want to do. So emphasis commonly is, is um, italic, but you could also go for another color or another typeface. And so it's very important that you keep these principles in mind, that you all, always go for intention and uh, for appearance. I did some faking of bolt and, and italics, but at some point, even if your toolbox is incomplete, there are certain tricks that you can go uh, for faking stuff. So if you have to fake something, if you have no other option, there are options for faking web. It's a very stupid example, but for example, if you want to have small caps and you don't have them, you may want to reduce your uh, caps, but of course it looks bad because it's a weight difference between the big caps and small caps. You can see it here, and also the spacing is different. So what you can do is not only decrease cap size, but if you have a slightly bolder weight, and then the tracking. So there are sometimes ways, even if you have typefaces that have not read everything that you want, there are some tricks and tips that you can use to get a, a better appearance. Um, at Ampersand in June, I saw a very nice, very short talk from uh, Lauren Spenny, who, uh, from my phones, who explains uh, a trick about fallbacks which like, blew me away because, as I said, I'm a web designer, so sometimes I go, wow, these guys are clever. But um, uh, what he did, font fallback uses on, uh, happens on a character basis. So he wanted to use old-style numerals, but he didn't have it in the font. So he had another font with old-style numerals that matched the main font, and he made a, a mini font with only the numerals and put it first in his fallback list. So any numeral that was in the text was shown in that typeface with only the old style numerals, and then for all the other characters, as they were not in that font, they used the normal typeface. 
And that's a brilliant way of like adapting yourself. You don't have a complete toolbox, but you use these little tricks with no markup. You have beautiful text with old style numerals just by adding that MIDI font in, in front of the fallback list. It's a very neat trick. So yeah, um, these characters, when you have to find them and how you can use them and so on. Because if you want to do math, and you use the X for multiplier is not the right uh, sign. You need another sign, multiply sign. So when you do white typography, if you are aware of all the possibilities, one of the first things you need to do is like look up HTML entities. I've got this list and it's constantly open. I constantly refer to it. I have to know like, I want to use a certain typographic sign. I need to find it. And there are two ways of defining it. And after a while, it becomes um, a uh, a reflex to always think which sign do I actually want to use. For example, also the trademark sign is not just a raised TM, which can also like mess with your line uh, spacing and so on. You have the proper sign for it. Yeah, one of the classic examples in fine typography, like to make your typography more typographic, is of course the quotes, the dumb quotes which have all, of course, the, the proper um, yeah, signs and, and, and markups. And the double quotes and then the single quotes. But that's, of course, yeah. you go for English language, but here in Germany, you know very well that's not sufficient if you want to do proper quotation marks. You know that they are defined nationally in every culture, every language has another way of doing quotes. So for example, that's the old style. In uh, Dutch, you have the opening at at the bottom, in French you have the guillemet, which you also know, but in a different direction. So that's one of the things you have to be very aware. Also, it's very important when you design multilingual uh, text that you keep these rules in mind. Same thing with n dash and n dash. Like the Americans have another way of, uh, of using them uh, than in Europe. So if you are aware of that, and you do multilingual web pages. It's always very good. It, it shows respect to your reader that you understand the cultural differences between texts. And it may seem like, all right, there's two blocks of body text, and I couldn't care less. I'm going to use that same international English version everywhere. But no, if you take one step further and you add, put some extra thought into it, it may not be like very important, but it's this thoughtful detail that shows respect to your readers. So this is a little example with all these different uh, types of quotation marks. And also, of course, then you have the apostrophes. The apostrophes are a problem often in CMS systems. I work, uh, the font feed is, is written in, uh, in WordPress. And WordPress, I don't know if it's standard, it's, I mean, the team in Fontshop makes care, takes care of everything. But uh, you have the system where it automatically inserts smart quotes. So you don't ever have the, the straight ones. But of course, there is only so far the machine can go. It has a certain logic. The logic says if quotation mark is preceded by space, it has to be the opening. But of course, if you have an apostrophe, you always have to come down. And then I see some people get over enthusiastic, and I get this quite a lot. I was like, Ooh, that's not, that's an acute accent. It's not the proper uh, uh, apostrophe. You have to actually get this one. So you insert it manually. That's why when I'm typing, even though I know the system will take care of all the quotation mark, I take care to always use the proper HTML entities. So I have, I'm 100% sure that when the reader reads it, that he has a proper typographic image. And I know sometimes I forget one, but I mean, that's unique. And the thing that I discovered as well quite early on is that when you have, when you add a link that's the uh, correct apostrophe that was included by CMS systems suddenly switched to the incorrect. And I think it has to do with the fact that the connection between the apostrophe and the text has been interrupted by the tag. So that's why it uh, messes up. So that's why it's, even when you think the CMS will take care of it, it is after letters, so it will be the proper one. Don't trust it because the invisible things that you see in your code that read really don't see may mess up your whole system and uh, introduce uh, uh, errors in your, in your typography. 
I, I want to go into the whole article about numerals because you may think that a typeface is 10 numbers from uh, 0 to 9. But in fact, most professional uh, typefaces have 100. Because it's like now, again, these new possibilities that were previously only available in print now also are av available on the internet. So it's, it's, it's a great thing that we can use them as well to create more beautiful texts. And of course, there are the four major divisions. We have the tabular ones with all the exact same uh, distances. And then the <coughs> horizontally, we have the the lining and the old style, and they all have their own uh, purpose, of course. This is why, yeah, the tabular, it's pretty obvious what you want it goes for. Um, but then you have the other ones, the, the old style, and when you have this type of text, you can make it, this is basic, and you can make it a lot more refined. So just a few little, little details that, that you change. So you can change all your uh, numbers to old style, which immediately blend in much better with the text. So you don't have these big blocks standing out in there. And we can add some of those uh, small caps that we mentioned before to make it a bit more classical. And then, of course, you have all these uh, notes there that you can also use the proper uh, numbers for. So beyond those 10 numbers, there's a lot more possibilities to make really fine typography, even a basic block of text that you, you don't need to know any code for it, any uh, CSS wizardry. It's just like getting their HTML entities and do it properly. And you may think, yeah, why do we need the lining proportionals one? For example, uh, for headlines, when you look at this, it blends in much better than if you use uh, the, the tabular ones, because then uh, yeah, you get these wide ones and so on that they are necessary for. You know, of course, you have to be very careful. That's, uh, for example, the reason why you cannot use Georgia in all caps as a headline, because then you get these things. It has standard old style uh, numerals, and you see that your neat blocks, your neat lines, suddenly get interruptions, depressions, and it looks a lot less good than uh, it looks with the lining. Uh, that's also one of these considerations when you are you going to use a, a, a typeface. Just a simple fact, what type of numerals does it have? Or it tells you, can I use it in, a, in a uppercase or uppercase or not? It's, it's, it may seem a futile detail, but it's, it's quite important if, if you want to achieve a nice typography. And then something like the, the old style tabular. You may think, why do we need old style tabular? Because when you make tables of text, you want everything to line up in both directions, but there are there are instances like here's all everything that we have that we may want to change. So we can go for uh, the old style to make it look nicer. But when you look here at the bottom, the phone numbers, fax, and cell phone numbers they don't line up. So this is one of the typical examples that you can use the old style tabular figures. So for every single figure style, there is an application that you can. Well, if you don't for which application you, you, uh, you can use it. And then, of course, there's more sophistication. They have all small caps figures, and you go then just to hate the heights of the small caps you have for use for this as well. Then there's an, another aspect, and that is very much, again, people coming from print and translating what they want to achieve just on a visual level to a web design and it doesn't work. So um, this is, for example, fixtures, big block of text that you want. And then you see there's like, you may want to, I mean, I'm making a couple of decisions that you may not agree with, uh, just to illustrate some points. Uh, I don't know if it's really better, but I thought it, may it might improve a little bit the, the appearance. I got big holes here. So what you could do is um, insert the discretionary hyphens, the ones that disappear that you even can't show. I don't understand John that well, but I thought it tells it something. So to make it better. And then of course you have a problem because here, the gallery, you do not want to hyphenate um, um, the capitalized words. And that's of course in Germany because you have the 
it's an amateur thing, but all, all capital assets there, you may want to translate them otherwise you get these big holes at the end. So we want to correct that. But then there's a thing, and that's of course my writing by typography is a thing that I encounter a lot, is that these solid typefaces like font fonts that also have FF, and I see font or ITC, I want this to stay together because I don't like it if it's broken. Um, and if I come from a print background, what many print designers would do is say, oh, yeah, I don't want this here, just insert a, a, a new line break. So you've got PR tag, so then you get this. Yeah, it looks fine. The problem is, of course, web is dynamic medium, so people may want to increase the size or make it smaller, <coughs> and then you have these things. Because, and this is, again, looking at appearance and not thinking about what you want to achieve, because the thing that you want to achieve is keep those two words together. But what you are doing is telling the text to start a new line, which is totally counterproductive. What you have to do is just make sure that these two things stay together, and whatever size the text will be, it will always have the proper appearance. So this is an entity that definitely you should know. I mean, I use it all the time. It does an breaking space. I mean, it's like one of these things that you have for punctuation, for example, in French, they, want, they often want to include spaces between the words and the guillemets, use this number in space all the time. You may think space is space, but no, there are like tens of spaces, I mean, maybe, but lots of spaces. You have thin space as well. If you have abbreviations, you have this dot string, too much space, you have the, the thin space, which, as a print design, you have to get used to the fact that thin space in um, um, layout programs like InDesign, it's a fixed space, it keeps everything <coughs> together, not on the internet. On the internet, this will break. So then, of course, you may have a problem because the names, you may want to keep it together, but if you want a thin space and at the end of the line, so it will break. There is no non breaking thin space, which I think is it's a shame, but whatever. The hair space, again, what I've said about the M and N dashes. For pause in your text, um, the Americans stick everything together. We in Europe, we tend to use the end space and add a little bit of space in there. But it doesn't have to be a full space. If you use a long one, you can use the hair space so it keeps a little bit of space between letters and, 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 the, and the punctuation mark. This also is very handy, the figure space. It's a space that is exactly the width of a figure. So if you have left lining a column, and there's a lot of numbers, and there's only one that sticks out instead of change or anything, you just use a uh, figure space and it will work fine. You also have the punctuation space that lines up everything neatly. And space, very neat little block. If you want to do indentation at the beginning of, of your line, you can go with either in CSS, but you can also uh, use end spaces also for, for uh, regular design. Space, of course, is just more than the actual space between words. There's also the space inside the letters, the space. Uh, actually, coming quickly aside, uh, there's a new book by Cyrus Highsmith that really explains very well the relationship between letter form and space. And he, he has these kind of tricks that he uh, it's inside paragraphs. It's worth checking out. And it just tells you like letter space and then you have bigger word space and then a little bigger um, the um, line space and it's really interesting how all this relates to each other and what you have to look out for. So within typefaces as well, the white inside letters is dramatically different. So you have the open typefaces, the closed typefaces. And when you know about reading, knowing that you, you on one side you look at the general word shape, but also you read actually the white between letters. This is very important to understand what you can and cannot do with spacing. So for example, if you if you have um, uh, lowercase texts, and, and, and Tim showed very nicely how the, the importance of having enough uh, word space between the, the words, you can also increase the, the space between the letters. You have to watch out with that because as we read these puzzle pieces in between the black, at some point the puzzle pieces get so distorted that we don't recognize them anymore and reading becomes very hard. And I have seen websites where they are very stylish and it's very airy text but you try to read it and it gives you massive headaches, it's not good. 
as you go bigger, of course, many of these typefaces were designed for text used or specifically headline faces, specifically faces for very small text, but there are faces that are just in between and that you may want to adapt. So when you go bigger, you can go with smaller space. That's less, uh, less uh, difficult to read. Of course, you have to watch out where you land. And of course, yeah, all caps, a little air, it's always nicer to like, diversify. So I guess that's it. If you have a 12 point typeface, it's 12 points. Mm -hmm. So the letter space, if you say like 0 0.1, then it will be 1.2 points. So you have to calculate the whole thing. But would you try and error? Most of these things is really like try and error. You just try it out. Ah, there is this great app, uh, Fontcast. And that, uh, no, no, there is Fontcast. It has been acquired by Monotype knowledge. Is it typecast? Yeah, it's, it, it allows you to, to yeah, typecast. It, it allows you to preview also features and so on. It's very handy. If you want to do web type of features like the H, uh, Fred Jones tweets that you can do Photoshop mockups, this, there, that's where you can try out these things. We go on another typeface and, uh, and do stuff to it to see how it behaves. Any more questions? I think this is probably one of the, the problems to, to actually implement all these things into websites. It's, uh, it's not that easy. Ready for a coffee? Yes. Okay, half an hour.